Greetings, my name is Lincoln Rice. I'm the coordinator for the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee. I've been a war tax resistor since 1998 and I've been a co coordinator for Nutric uh, since 2018. So this is our introduction to war tax resistance. Uh, the theme of this is we won't pay war tax resistance and resisting US militarism. So some important disclaimers. There definitely are some methods of war tax resistance that are illegal, they're against the law, and there could be consequences uh, for doing so. So this, for, if you're practicing a method that's against the law, it's definitely an act of civil disobedience. Uh, we'll be going through what the law is, what's usually done in practice, uh, but also realizing that the government could change how it implements these laws or how much it actually puts them into practice. So we're gonna be sharing historical experience realizing that things could change. We're not here to try to try to, to figure out how to cheat, fudge, or use gimmicks to avoid taxes. It's again, more to let people know what their options are and the risks associated with those options if they practice war tax resistance. Uh, I happen to have a bachelor's degree in accounting, so have a basic understanding of what, you know, of the tax system and bookkeeping and those sorts of things, but I'm not a CPA. Um, and are a financial advisor or a lawyer, uh, though many of our resources have had input from a legal advisor to make sure we're correctly uh, stating the law in certain instances. But again, we're here to share uh, the decades of experience that war tax resistors have had in practicing war tax resistance. So NUTRIC, which we call our organization for short, the National War Tax Resistance Coordinating Committee is a coalition of groups and individuals uh, across the United States. Uh, we were founded in 1982 to support those uh, refusing to pay taxes for war and violence. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time at these intro slides. Uh, we'll, this is more some background, then we'll go into the methods, myths about war tax resistance, and then actual possible consequences. So as you can see here, the United States spends significantly more on its military than any other country in the world. Even in the United States within its own budget for collected taxes, the US spends significant amounts of money on past and current military expenses. It usually hovers somewhere between 40 and 50% of the budget. Uh, this is uh, put together each year by the War Resisters League who takes time to look through the president's proposed budget and actually figures out where items belong um, in said budget. People resist for a number of reasons who are part of our movement. There's obviously the military budget, border militarization, federal prisons, the militarization of police. Here we have a, a tank that through the 1033 program, the uh, US military um, gave to the Lakeland, Florida Police Department. There's torture and war crimes, the environment, uh, the US military is the number one institutional user of gas in the world though um, climate agreements like the Paris Accord exempt military um, emissions from those accords. And then more recently, of course, the invasion of Gaza using US weapons. I'm not gonna go through all of these again, but just to highlight a couple instances of war tax resistance. It seems if we have enough information about a society, we can probably find an instance of war tax resistance. So one of the earliest instances of war tax resistance in what we now call the United States goes back to the 17th century when an Algonquin tribe refused to pay ta uh, taxes for a Dutch fort. More recently, when there was a military coup in Myanmar, otherwise known as Burma in 2021, millions of people there refused to pay their utility bills as a public utility and those funds were a great source of income for um, for the military there. So people who resisted those utility bills, many of them had um, armed soldiers come into their homes demanding payments. So we'll see that the risks for war tax resistance in the United States are not as great as those people are facing in Myanmar. So the, there can be, uh, depending on how one looks at war tax resistance, you could say, oh, there's lots of flexibility I can look, you know, based on my goals, risk tolerances and values, it's, it's not a cookie cutter type of thing. I can really fashion it to what I'm comfortable with for my situation. Others, if they wanted to look at it from the other perspective could say, 
this is complicated because I can't just resist taxes like the person I already know who's doing it. So there's a lot of flexibility that can be uh, an advantage, but also means a lot of thought needs to go into this before someone actually uh, chooses a method that they're going to practice. Uh, so how do you resist uh, military taxes for war? There's two kind of umbrella methods, uh, which then there are you know, many variations below that. The illegal method that civil disobedience is you refuse to pay some or all of the income taxes you owe and then choose to file or not to file. So this, no matter how much you're refusing is against the law. The only legal method is to earn less than the taxable income amount. This would be the legal method just not to owe federal income taxes. Uh, so oftentimes that's based on the standard deduction. Standard deduction for a single person in 2024 is $14,600. For a married couple, it's $29,200. Head of household, it's $21,900. Though there could be other deductions or tax credits that could raise that limit and still allow you not to owe any federal income taxes. So if you're an employee and you might notice, well, my taxes are already taken out of my paycheck. Uh, there's nothing I can do about it. At the end of the year, I get a refund. Uh, so for these, there's the option of what we call W-4 resistance. So you may have a memory that on your first day of work or when you accepted a job offer that you were given a W-4. Uh, it's a form created by the IRS, but just meant for you to give to your employers so that they know how much to take out of your paycheck. So I'm not going to go through how to fill it out, but essentially you can fill it out in such a way that either a smaller amount or nothing is taken out of your uh, paycheck. And so we have a website dedicated to this, nutric.org backslash W-4. And uh, there we have a video, a flyer, and a short eight-page booklet, depending on what depth of analysis or what style of learning is better for you, if you want to practice W-4 resistance. This then gives you the option if you want to pay your taxes or not on April 15th. It could also just be an option that if you currently get a refund to adjust your W-4 to make it accurate so that you don't owe anything and you're not, or you're not getting a refund so that you're just simply not giving the IRS a free loan for the whole year uh, to spend on war and violence. If you're self-employed, the situation works a little bit differently. You don't fill out a W-4, you fill out a W-9. That's if you're working for usually a corporation. If you're like a carpenter doing household work, work for households, they're not required to report anything, so they wouldn't take any of that information uh, from you. But if you're working for a corporation, they'll do a W-9 where they take your name, address, and social security number at the end of the year using a 1099-NEC, non-employee compensation form. Uh, if you made more than $600 or they paid you more than $600 in income, they'll report that to you and to the IRS. In this method, they do not take taxes out for um, your federal income taxes that are due on April 15th or for Social Security and Medicare, you're responsible for paying all of those. So again, it's in one sense easier to practice war tax resistance if you're self-employed. Um, it also, depending on what type of self-employed work, it might be more under the table if someone maybe wanted to fi not file or try to fall through the cracks a bit more. Uh, we've also seen the growth of the gig economy, which results in the 1099-K form being filed. That's a form that's basically used anytime there's a third party that's holding income money for you before it's given to you. So that actually could be if you're a small business and you receive payments from Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, uh, those are all third parties that hold the money temporarily for you. So you'd get a 1099-K. Could also be if you drive for Uber. Uh, you're not actually working for Uber. They're just... Uh, letting you know there's people who want to ride, they'll take the money temporarily from them and then give it to you. So anytime there's a third party involved, it's the 1099K. Through tax year 2023, you'd only get this form if you had income in excess of $20,000 and more than 200 transactions. For tax year 2024, they're lowering the reporting to simply $5,000. In 2025, if you receive more than $600 in this type of income, it'll be reported. So that's definitely something to be aware of. Filing versus not filing. One, you're more seen and noticed. The other, you're a bit more hidden. 
So there could be advantages or disadvantages for both, or it could also depend on what your values are. So when we talk about filing, you know that the IRS will at least have an accurate assessment of what you owe, and it allows you to send a letter of protest if you would wish. So briefly going over to not filing, if you don't file and the IRS chooses to file on your behalf, they notice that you should have filed and you're not. When they file on your behalf, they usually overestimate your income. So if at some point you become collectible, uh, they could end up collecting much more than they should have. So even if you're choosing not to file, we always recommend that you fill out your forms and keep all the paperwork on that uh, so that you could dispute it if the IRS files on your behalf and starts collecting from you. Going back to filing, it's much easier for the IRS to start the collection process because before they can collect taxes, they need to assess the tax debt. And in order to do that, you need to have filed. So again, you can see where if you don't file, the IRS, they might never get around to filing on your behalf. So it's, you are kind of completing that first step for them. A lot of people who file like to do it because it starts the 10 year statute of limitations. So once they process your tax forms and assess that tax debt, uh, now they have 10 years to either collect the money or if they choose to criminally prosecute you, uh, which is rare, which we'll get into later. But once the 10 years passes, then they can no longer collect the money or criminally prosecute you. Uh, there's an exception if you filed forms that were fraudulent, if you over, if you underestimate your income or put lower income on purpose or take deductions you shouldn't have. If you're filing a false 1040 form at the end of the year, that's tax fraud. There's no statute of limitations on that. Um, it can also make it easier to apply for scholarships, health care insurance subsidies, et cetera. So uh, to be clear, you don't need to pay your income taxes to qualify for uh, student loans or Obamacare. But if, for student loans, it's also not required that you file, but they like to verify your income amount by looking at your filed tax forms. And depending on what worker you're working with, with the student loan people, uh, they may be more or less open to trying to verify your income in other ways. With health insurance subsidies, it's actually required that you file. Um, if you don't file, you'll be kicked off or not be able to get them in the first place. Uh, going to not filing, as we mentioned, it makes IRS collection more difficult because first they need to file on your behalf and that takes more work on their part and they are grossly underfunded at the moment. Uh, there's no statute of limitations, or at least not until they file on your behalf. Once they file on your behalf, which will assess the amount of tax debt, then the 10-year clock starts. Uh, there's also an additional penalty for not filing. So some myths about war tax resistance. I'll go to jail. So very few war tax resistors have gone to jail. Uh, since the end of World War II, only one person has gone to jail simply for not paying their taxes. So to be clear, that's something to be aware of. Simply not paying your federal income taxes is an offense that could land you in prison. But the only war tax resistor who actually faced this since the end of World War II was Tony Serra in 2005. Uh, probably the IRS chose to pick on him because he's an activist lawyer. And part of the, um, part of the prosecution of that law needs to be that the person understood what they were doing and that's much easier to prove with a lawyer. Uh, so I would say there's a heightened risk for lawyers and they'd wanna think more about this uh, than someone who's not a lawyer. Uh, otherwise, especially in over the last 25 years, the only people who have uh, done jail time for war tax resistance are those who have filed fraudulent forms. As long as you file accurate forms, at least you could still, they could change their policy, but at the moment they're not criminally prosecuting those who file accurate forms, but they will at times practice different forms of collection, which is not the criminal division of the IRS, but the civil division of the IRS. Uh, the IRS will take my home, car, or property. So this is something that wouldn't have been a myth if we were talking about the 70s, 80s, early 90s. Uh, it was actually very common during that time for them to particularly take cars. It'd be very common for you to know a war tax resistor friend who had had a car taken. And then you might know, at least maybe not in your inner circle of friends, but you probably have heard of people who had homes taken. That did happen from time to time. Uh, but the IRS had a change of 
practice and strategy starting in the late 90s. So we see this drop. So this is from their own information. We see where they had been taking in excess of 10,000 pieces of property a year. And now since the late 90s, it's anywhere between 50 and 400 pieces of property a year. This seems to be a practice that at the moment, they more reserve for the rich who are not paying their taxes for whatever reason. The IRS will just get the money in the end. So this is uh, a, gra a graphic from the IRS themselves that shows the gross tax gap. So the gross tax gap is they estimate what they believe is owed to the federal government on a yearly basis minus what is actually paid. So they believe that the gross tax gap, the amount that should be paid that's not every year is $458 billion. So close to half a trillion dollars. Uh, by historical precedent, they believe that at the end of the day, after the statutes of limitation run out or things just become too old to really look into, they'll collect about $52 billion of that. So that's roughly 12 or 13%. So we can see that the majority of unpaid federal income taxes, they never collect. War tax resistors don't pay for things we need. So it's a common practice of those war tax resistors who are refusing to pay some or all of their federal income taxes to redirect those funds to organizations and groups that can use the money. And so uh, the, the, some we often do that as individuals, but there's also those who do it in larger groups, uh, particularly in the San Francisco Bay area and in the Boston area, there are what we call alternative funds that'll do kind of group direction. They accept, um, they accept applications from local organizations and groups working on a variety of issues of human need that uh, they redirect funds. So things that they see as underfunded and not prioritized by the federal government. So what are the actual risks? So you could face a social security or wage garnishment. Uh, when it comes to um, a wage garnishment or perhaps a levy if you're working you know, as a self-employed person, I often refer to these as the reverse lottery. It's not extremely common. I'll hear of a couple of folks a year that either as a self-employed person, let's say they're doing work for some newspapers or some sort of corporation, they may receive a, a levy there or you know, a wage employee may receive a salary garnishment. So again, it's not common, but it does happen. Social security garnishments, on the other hand, are very common for those receiving social security who owe a tax debt. I think because it's another federal agency, it's just um, much easier to process that and to get that in action. And so if they begin a social security garnishment, they normally take 15% of your, of your social security every month. Bank seizures, also very rare, but if, again, if they know you have a bank account, either because of reported interest or in that in a previously you had paid taxes um, with a wire transfer from a bank account, then uh, they'll know about it and may eventually get around to seizing bank funds. If you have a if you overpaid to your state, they may seize a state refund before you can get that back. Interest and penalties, uh, a good rule of thumb is that no matter what amount you are refusing to resist in a given year, after 10 years, uh, you'll see that amount double. So if you're resisting $100, it'll probably go up to 200. If you're resisting $1,000, it'll go up to about $2,000. So that's just so you know the risks associated if you happen to be collected upon right before the 10 year statute of limitations expired. We already talked about health insurance subsidies and student loans. A notice of a public lien. Uh, once you owe about $20,000, the IRS will send um, notice of a public lien to your local county courthouse. The practical effect of this is, let's say you owned a home. That's a transaction that if you were selling your home, it would get processed or at some point through the county courthouse and the bank processing the loan for the buyer would check to see if there's any uh, public liens against you. So in that sense, they'd have an opportunity to collect those funds uh, that are due to them first before you get the rest of the money. Uh, in the past, we also saw at the same time, they'd probably send a letter to crediting agencies, which could affect one's credit. Um, but in recent years, they've been still good about the public liens, but they haven't been contacting 
uh, crediting agencies. But again, that could change. And then there's the possible loss of a passport for uh, debts over $62,000. So if you have what they call a seriously delinquent tax debt, I, if you currently have a passport, you can use it till it expires, but you won't be able to renew it or if you don't have one, you won't be able to receive a new passport. So this number goes up with inflation at $62,000 for 2024. It goes up $1,000 or more every year. Uh, but this is a law that went into effect in 2018. It's still uncertain if it's constitutional or not, but thus far it's held up in the lower courts and lower uh, appeal courts. Uh, this is something that uh, you may recall at the beginning of the Biden administration. There, as part of a larger bill, there was $80 billion approved for the IRS over 10 years. This would be a major windfall for them that would allow them to get back up to their budgeting and worker levels of, of about 10 years ago. They still weren't that effective 10 years ago, but at least they sent out a few more wage garnishments and bank levies and those sorts of things. Um, so it helped them improve that a little bit. Uh, with some of the compromises between the Republican Congress and President Biden to raise the debt ceiling. We've seen this gutted during the Biden years. Uh, so whether they'll end up getting this money or not will largely depend on uh, who's the president and who's in charge of Congress going forward. So lastly, Nutric has many resources on our website, uh, materials of newsletters that come out every two months, blogs, interviews, tax day activities, gatherings, workshops. We also have a counselor list. Uh, so in about 35 states, uh, we have folks who are war tax resistors who are volunteering their time and have gone some, undergone some additional training to be more aware of the entire landscape of war tax resistance who are there to be called or emailed that if you had a question, you could connect with someone locally and they could help you decide, you know, what you're comfortable with and what method you're looking for that works best for you. So uh, the, there'll be a link to that in the description. So Nutric, all of our resources are available for free. Um, the only things we charge for are things that we send in the mail to essentially cover uh, shipping and handling and uh, the production of the materials in their paper format. But otherwise, everything that we produce is available for free, and uh, we simply uh, survive on donations. So you can, if you maybe aren't comfortable with war tax resistance but want to support us, feel free to go to our website and click the donate button. We appreciate it. It helps us keep everything up to date and available to folks. Then lastly, this will be available. You'll notice this in the description to this video, but we have our website again, the W4 page our counselor contact list, uh, link to sign up for our newsletter. And then there's also the, lastly, the tax penalty fund. So this is a fund, uh, it's, it, we host their website, but they're a separate group from Nutric. They're a group of war tax resistors who are essentially a mutual aid society. So they're there that if someone is collected upon, they're one of the unlucky few, uh, they don't reimburse for the amount collect, um, for the principal on the tax, but for the penalties and interest, which can be, you know, that extra hit that you <laughs> uh, may have to deal with if you happen to be collected upon those penalties and interest, they'll essentially pass the hat and are able to reimburse usually for the entire amount of interest and penalties collected. So there are resource that are available to us. And even though war tax resistance is a very private decision tailored to what we are comfortable with, we are here to support each other. I think that's what Nutric is for, but also the tax penalty fund puts that in a very active format when it comes to even supporting each other financially. So again, thank you for taking the time to watch this video, learn more about war tax resistance and uh, hopefully these resources can help you make an accurate um, decision about where you'd like to go from here.